Our next speaker is Sydney Sims. Sydney is chair of the English department here at Moorpark College, where she has taught since 1989. She holds an MA in English and a PhD in Scandinavian and medieval studies. She teaches composition and literature with special interests in medieval and Renaissance literature. She practices Zen, yoga, and martial arts. Her heroes are William Shakespeare, John Lennon, and Xena, Warrior Princess. Her talk today is titled, How Not to Tame Your Dragon. Let's give a warm welcome to Sydney Sims. Good morning. As a lifelong English major, I was pleased and a little surprised to be invited to speak today. I think people are a little mystified about what English majors actually do. <laughs> when I mention that social occasions that I teach English, people get a little shy and shifty. They're afraid they're going to say something like, me and Bobby went to the beach, <laughs> get their knuckles wrapped. English teachers were the grammar police. I was especially pleased given all the emphasis in education these days on what they're calling the STEM disciplines. Why not MEST or SMET? <laughs> Obviously, it's because STEM tells a story. And it's a story we like, right? It's about flowers. Stems are green, growing things. They support leaves and flowers and fruit. STEM disciplines, they're the STEM of the future. This is what English majors do. <laughs> we tell stories and read stories and write stories. We listen to the stories that get told all around us every day, often unconsciously, and pull them up into consciousness. That might dispel some of the mysterious power they have over us, but it gives us a lot of power over them. It gives us a chance to decide if these are really the stories that we want to tell. Telling stories is how we make sense of the raw data of our lives. Lives are messy, uh, they're random, they're unpredictable. What even counts as a life? Where does somebody's life story begin? At the moment of their birth? Why not with the glorious deeds of an illustrious ancestor like an Icelandic saga? Where does it end? At death? Why not at marriage, like a Shakespeare comedy? <laughs> <laughs> or with the accomplishments of a famous grandchild. After all, to your DNA, this body is a very temporary vessel on the way to some much more interesting mutation. So telling stories is a way that we give this haphazard time on the planet shapeliness and meaning. By the way, have you noticed that on the planet is a very recent way of saying alive? Yeah. I don't recall anybody ever saying on the planet before the moon landing in 1969. It was the first time that we had seen Earth as a body in space. Our story about what the Earth was changed forever with that one small step. The trick is to find stories that are worth telling and not just repeat the ones that we've all heard before. The culture tells us stories about work and love and religion from before we can speak. It tells the story about gender from before we're even born. For most people, these aren't even stories. They're just how the world is. They're just so. It's not until we become conscious of our stories that we can get a chance to see something different, that we can move away from being pre-programmed robots and start to be full-on human beings. A friend of mine recently got a rude shock. She was in the checkout line with her groceries when the clerk very publicly announced that her credit card had been refused. No problem, another credit card, also refused. She thus discovered to her horror that her husband had maxed out their credit cards to the tune of some $60,000 without telling her about it. She was, of course, mortified and enraged. When she told me about it, she called it this betrayal. Now, betrayal is a very loaded word, and it comes prepackaged with a whole story. The story is about me, the victim, and him, the villain. In marriage, it's usually a story about sexual infidelity, and it's a very big deal. By choosing this word and the story that came along with it, she had leapt from an unpleasant event in the checkout line to the possibility of divorce. And stories have a lot of power, and the less conscious they are, the more powerfully they can move us to action. One of the stem stories of English literature is a long poem about the warrior Beowulf. Uh, Beowulf is a hero's hero. He starts his career by killing the troll-like monster Grendel, which is a tough fight for him, even though he has a strength of 30 in his hand grip. After he kills Grendel and Grendel's equally troll-like mother, 
He loyally supports his king and his king's sons and finally becomes king in his own right and reigns for 50 years, fiercely defending his kingdom against all invaders. But eventually the poet has a problem, how to give the story of this aging hero a satisfying ending. Beowulf can't just sink into senility and fade away. He needs a worthy opponent for a last battle so he can go out with heroic glory. Luckily, there's a dragon at hand. Since the 1960s, dragons have become very popular thanks largely to J.R.R. Tolkien. In The Hobbit, Tolkien created the dragon Smaug, and from Smaug have sprung a whole taxonomy of dragons. Ursula Le Guin's uh, Dragons of Earthsea, Anne McCaffrey's Dragons of Pern, the Dragon Riders of Aragon, Harry Potter's various species of hand-hatched dragons, and all those little pewter figurines on gamers' shelves everywhere. Yeah, you know who you are. <laughs> Smaug is the first dragon I know of to talk, and his progeny have been getting more and more domesticated ever since. All these dragons are descendants of Beowulf's dragon and its kin. Beowulf is a poem in Old English, also known as Anglo-Saxon, the very earliest form of the English language. It's preserved in a single manuscript from the 10th century. The dragon has been sitting on a hoard of gold in an underground barrow for hundreds of years. This is what dragons do. He has no use for this gold, but he knows every coin in the hoard. And when someone breaks in and steals a golden cup, the dragon takes revenge by flying around, burning up the countryside, including Beowulf's own mead hall. Hoard winna fond eald usheada, open a stand on se de birn on a burga secheth. Nachod nistraga, nichtes fleugeth, fierre befangen, hina foldbuen suida an dradet. Hea secian shall hoard an chrusan, there a heathen gold, wadeth winfrum frode, ne bith him wichte this cell. Cool, huh? <laughs> uh, Beowulf's dragon is related to similar dragons all throughout early Germanic literature. Uh, Beowulf calls the dragon out of its lair and kills it, but not before it bites him and injects its venom into him, and they die together, and the treasure goes back under the ground. All these dragons spout deadly venom, or fire, or both. They all sit on underground treasure, and they're all furious and destructive. Dragons are one way we tell ourselves the story of our own greed, irrationality, and rage. White whales are an unrelated species, but they also come from the deeps and are inscrutably hostile. But stories aren't just found in novels about whales or poems in ancient manuscripts. Uh, we all tell stories every day on every level. Stories are how we make sense of, of, of our lives. When we take the raw material of our lives and arrange it in a, in a narrative, that is when we make it into a story, we decide what we're going to tell and what we're going to ignore or hide or forget. What we're going to foreground and what we're going to background. We're actually choosing what counts as an event and what doesn't. For example, a shoplifted candy bar might not rate a story, uh, right, not made a mention in one person's story, but it might be the beginning of somebody else's life of crime. Once we piece together a sequence of events, we tend to see it as a series of causes and effect. At age eight, she started piano lessons. At 12, she suffered her first mental breakdown. <laughs> Two unrelated events or cause and effect? Did those piano lessons ruin her life? <laughs> We're always looking for a coherent story to make sense of the random flickers of everyday life. We tell stories on every level, from the individual to the universal. An individual story might be, I look fabulous every single second, or I am bravely battling cancer. Actually, an individual life might have both those stories going on, but they're going to be hard to reconcile. Yeah. Families have narratives as well. A family story might be, our son is a hopeless heroin addict, and then everything in the family's life gets swept into that story. How could we have prevented this? Or, thank God our daughter is doing OK. On a broader scale, nations have stories. America is the city on a hill, favored by God, a righteous example to the whole world. 
This is the story the pilgrims brought with them, and many of us still subscribe to it today. And of course, we tell stories about other countries. They mostly serve to make our country look better. Moving up from the national level, religions have stories. Most of us are familiar with the Christian narrative of creation, fall, redemption. Though when I lay this cosmic history out in my survey of English literature class these days, more and more students are looking baffled. Buddhism now has quite a different story. Its first noble truth is life is suffering. I have a friend from Thailand who's fond of quoting one version of the Buddhist narrative, Gert, Ga, Jep, Die. Born, old, sick, die. You can see that these two different stories might evoke quite different responses to illness and adversity. If you think that your difficulties are God testing your faith, you might act quite differently from how if you think that they're your well-deserved karma sprung from your previous actions. Since we've gone global, we're in the middle of constructing planetary narratives, such as climate change will destroy life on Earth as we know it. If you're of a Saturnine disposition, you might end that sentence within a generation. If you're more sanguine, you might add, unless we do something to change it right now. And scientists are busily constructing the story of the universe. It used to be that the universe is expanding. Is the universe still expanding? I, I thought I heard on NPR the other day that the universe was contracting. It's hard to keep track. I can't imagine a plot line of stories based on string theory, but I'll bet you they're different from the ones based on Newton's laws. F science, in fact, is steered by our cultural narrative, as Thomas Kuhn showed in his 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Scientific breakthroughs come not just from facts and discoveries, but from imagination and intuition and from changes in the cultural mindset. For example, the Chinese recorded sunspots for centuries before they were observed by Galileo. In the Christian West, we knew that everything above the moon, being closer to God and unfallen, was perfect and unchanging. Anomalies like sunspots couldn't possibly exist, so they didn't. Without this cultural narrative, the Chinese were free to see and record what they saw. The stories we tell about ourselves and the world determine what we see, what questions we ask, what research projects we fund. When the story changes, the data change to align with it. The real stem is the story. The math will get in line. <laughs> the root story is the one that begins with I. When you hear somebody say, I'm the kind of person who, you can bet you're in the presence of story. Narrative is central to who we are. If your story goes, I came from behind, but through hard work and good choices, I'm making a terrific life for myself, you probably make it through setbacks without crumpling. Whereas if your story is, eh, my whole family's a bunch of losers and I fit right in, you might have some trouble getting that job application filled out. It's not that these stories aren't true. You may well have come from behind and be making a great life for yourself. But there's 20 other stories that would fit the evidence just as well. And once we start telling a story, it tends to keep unfolding in the same direction. We make choices based on the narrative instead of on any objective reality. That's why it's wise to pay attention to our story and tell it consciously in a direction that we'd like it to go. My friend with the maxed out credit cards she talked about betrayal for a week or so and got more and more miserable and angry. Betrayal was her dragon. It was attacking her with poison and fire. Then she started talking about forgiveness. Now, forgiveness sounds like a nice positive word, but really it's part of the same overarching narrative. It might empower the victim, but she's still the victim. After a few more days, she started using quite different language. She realized that not having a taste for numbers, she had relegated the family finances to her husband. She never looked at the credit card bills. That was his job. She started to realize that she needed to take more responsibility for that important work and to take a more equal share in their finances. And since then, they've started to restructure their whole relationship along the lines of a more equal partnership. She slew her dragon by telling a different story. It was a brilliant solution. Instead of following that downward path of betrayal, she chose a new and liberating path towards greater communication and greater mutuality. Dragons are metaphors 
for our dark places. The problem with metaphors, though, is they're so hypnotic. We start to take them literally and forget that they're supposed to carry symbolic value. Oh, there are these marvelous creatures called dragons. I want one. <laughs> we tame them and turn them into commodities. But when we commodify our dragons, we trivialize them. We turn them into silly cartoons or giant amusement park rides, as in the film Avatar, or into adorable flying puppies, as in DreamWorks' How to Train Your Dragon. OK, it's cool that boys, even traditionally bloodthirsty Viking boys, can now be sensitive to animal rights. Uh, they do get dumb names like Hiccup instead of good Norse names like Eric Bloodaxe or Sigurd Snake in the Eye. But ultimately, we need the monster after all. At the end of that film, even the dragons, whom the Vikings have now made friends with, turn out to be enslaved to an even bigger, badder, really evil boss dragon. You just can't keep a good monster down. In order to be heroes, which is another way of saying, in order to be fully human, we need a worthy opponent to measure ourselves against. Our stories need real monsters. We need the dark, dangerous places and the unsolvable problems. We need the sense that life is bigger than we are, that we can't be in control of it. We can't tame it. In fact, the monster creates the hero. Who would Captain Ahab be without Moby Dick? Who would Beowulf be without his dragon? Dragons represent our dark places. Before we can resolve our problems and sit down to tea with our demons, admittedly an admirable goal, we need to listen to our fears, to let them be as scary as they really are. We need to look betrayal right in the eye with sword drawn. For our lives to be meaningful, our dragons have to be dangerous. And insofar as we are the hero, we have to step up and throw everything into the battle. There are other more cheerful stories, of course. Perhaps you're starring in a romantic comedy at the moment. <laughs> Lucky you. But it's the business of English majors, and in fact, it's the business of all of us to listen carefully to the stories that we live. Becoming conscious of our stories gives us a lot of power. On the one hand, we can feel their real physical enchantment. On the other hand, because we know their stories, we can hold them lightly and know when to rewrite them, when to turn betrayal into responsibility and reconciliation, and ultimately, ultimately into love. Thank you.